Hi, welcome back. When I say German, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is precise, right? There are, there are precise people and it makes them really good at stuff like engineering. I mean, you want to buy a German car, not an Italian car. And banking. I mean, when you think about banking, you think about Bundesbank, right? The, if you think about central banks that had incredible reputations and respect, the Bundesbank was way up there. And until recently, you'd have said Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank, of course, is the quintessential German bank, a bank that's been able to survive world wars and, and recessions and depressions and still come out of it intact. So it's a bit of a surprise when you see a bank like Deutsche get into the trouble that it's in and you hear talk of whether the bank will make it. When you think about it, it's a, almost a Greek tragedy at a German bank. I mean, talk about schadenfreude. I love these German words and that word might actually fit here. So let's talk Deutsche. Let's trace out how Deutsche got where it was. Deutsche has been having troubles since 2008. One problem after another. Some of these troubles you can trace back to the mistakes they made leading into 2008. Some of it can be traced to the fact that their exposure in the problem EU countries, the southern European countries. Some of it can be traced to management mistakes. In other words, this problem has lots of reasons. And the problem was under uh, was 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 uh, you know we've been talking about it for a, for a few years, but it came to a boil lo- a couple of weeks ago when the U.S. Department of Justice levied a fine of 14 billion dollars on Deutsche for transgressions in pricing mortgage-backed securities way back pre-2008. Now this is the fine that's been levied. Obviously, Deutsche gets to contest it, and we don't know what the final fine will be. But this, in a sense, tipped the scales and push this from a problem to a crisis. So let's take a step back and let's look at how Deutsche got to where it is today. Let's start with the numbers. In this graph, I have the net income and the return in equity for Deutsche going back to the 1980s. And as you trace through the years, you can see that until about 2000, Deutsche was a profitable bank, but not an extraordinarily profitable bank. But in the first part of the last decade, you see them kind of jump into the banking bandwagon of taking more risk, getting into more risky businesses. And it did pay off, right? It paid off until 2007 as profits rose pretty dramatically. Then, of course, you had 2008. Like every other bank on the face of the earth, Deutsche was hurt. And it looked like it was coming back in 2009. So it looked like it was, in this, but then it relapsed. It relapsed because of its Europe exposure. It relapsed for other reasons. And you can see that after about 2012, the bottom's in a sense fallen out of the bank. In fact, over the last two years, the bank has lost almost $16 billion. And its return in equity is now a big negative number, minus between, no, minus 13%. So question is, what do we do now? So clearly, the losses are accumulating, and it's starting to show up in that number that all banks watch, which is their regulatory capital. I'm going to use the Tier 1 capital. This is the regulatory capital in Tier 1 that Deutsche has as my proxy for the regulatory problems, the capital problems that Deutsche is facing. And if you look at this graph, actually, it doesn't look like there's a problem because if you look at the ratio at the end of 2015 of Tier 1 capital to risk-adjusted assets, I mean, that's a ratio that regulators track as well. Deutsche's regulatory capital ratio is actually higher than it was pre-2008. It is lower than it was in 2014, but it doesn't look like it's any kind of crisis yet. Now, of course, what's tipping the scale now is there's about you know $65 billion of regulatory capital at the end of 2015. And if the fine kicks in, remember, it's $14 billion, that's going to wipe out more than 20% of that regulatory capital. That's the fear that's triggering this particular meltdown. So you've got a, two years of bad losses with no real end in sight. You've got this tier one capital deterioration and the market, not surprisingly, reacted to the DOJ fine. It reacted on several fronts. It started off by pushing down the price of Deutsche Bonds, saying, hey, there's more default risk. It showed up more directly in the CDS, the Deutsche CDS rough measure of the probability of default it climbed and the stock price not surprisingly went from about no more than twenty dollars down to about thirteen dollars but that reflects a much larger drop that's been occurring since 2008 where the company's lost almost 80 percent of its market cap so it's not debatable that Deutsche stock price has collapsed 
and the bank is in trouble. The question is, what do we do as investors now? Now, of course, you could make the, uh, the decision that some contrarian investors do, that any stock that drops 80% has to be undervalued and buy it. But that's why I call that knee-jerk contrarian investing. It's an extremely dangerous way to go about it. So the reality has shifted. The, the bank is less profitable. It has regulatory capital issues. So I decided to value Deutsche today, given the world it's in, not the world I wished it was in. So to start the process, I took a look at profitability across banks using return and equity as my proxy for profitability. Across all banks, this is in October of 2016, so this is global banks, there are 616 banks in the sample. The average return on equity across these banks was 9.7%. The median is about 9.91%. A really high return on equity for a bank, the 75th percentile would put you close to 15%. And at the 25th percentile, you'd make 5.85%. Remember, Deutsche's current return on equity is minus 13.7%. So we have a lot of digging to do to get out. I'm sorry, digging to do to get out of this particular problem. So let's get started. So here's what I did. I projected that Deutsche, Deutsche's profitability would improve. To what? Over the next five years, I assumed the improvement would occur to the 5.85 percent. That's the 25th percentile. So that's the first climb they have to do is to get from the minus 13 to plus plus 5.82. So that'll bring them to the 25th percentile. And over the following five years, I assume that Deutsche will continue to improve its return on equity, not even to the median of 9.91%, but to a number, 9.44%. You're saying, where did that number come from? That is actually the cost of equity for a median bank, and I'll come back to that later. I'm essentially not asking Deutsche to do miracles. I'm just assuming that over time, its return on equity will converge on its cost of equity. It won't even make excess returns, just make its cost of equity. As the return on equity improves, and you multiply it by my expected common equity over time. And you're saying, why is the common equity climbing the way it is? And we'll come back and talk about that because it is going to require new capital coming in. And that new capital is going to be, you know, it's going to affect your cash flows. We'll come back to why the common equity is going up. But that common equity times the return equity gives me my net income going forward. Now, this isn't a very optimistic picture I'm painting for Deutsche if you look at the net income because I expect them to lose money for the next two years, a substantial amount of money. They will turn the corner in year three and start to make the slightest amount of profit and then they start improving their profits to about $8.2 billion by the time you get out 11 years. So essentially, I am, I'm seeing a slow but steady improvement in profitability over time for Deutsche. That's the first leg of my Deutsche valuation is tracing out the shifts in profits over time. Here's the second leg. That regulatory capital problem, Deutsche can't live with that problem. The regulators can't live with the problem. Investors are going to be terrified with that problem. They've got to get out of that problem. So again, to get a sense of where they need to move to, I looked across all global banks. The, me, the average tier one capital ratio, this is tier one divided by risk adjusted assets across all banks is 13.74%. The median is 12.96. At the 75th percentile, the tier one capital is 15.67%. At the 25th, it's 10.71%. Deutsche actually doesn't look that bad relative to the 25th to the 25th percentile. It is lower than the median, but not by much. But I think Deutsche has to set its standards higher. So here's what I'm going to assume that over the next year, they will need to infuse enough capital to at least move up to the average, which would be 13.77%. And over the next nine years, from year one through year 10, that they will push themselves up to the 75th percentile, partly because Deutsche is in riskier businesses than traditional pure banks. So over time, the regulatory capital ratios go from 12.41%, which is where they will end up at. And to get the 12.41 percent, here's what I had to do. I took the existing tier one capital and I reduced it by 10 billion. You're saying, where did the 10 billion come from? Remember that 14 billion dollar fine that the Department of Justice is is it is levying on the on the bank? Deutsche actually countered by saying that it expected the fine to end up being only six billion. I think the truth is going to fall somewhere in the middle. That they're going to end up with about a 10 billion dollar fine. I've reduced their tier one capital by the 10 billion right away. And I've also reduced the common equity, the book equity, by $10 billion. So that gives me my starting point for tier one capital of about $55.2 billion. 
And each year, here's what I do. As my tier one capital ratio climbs from 12.41% all the way to 15.67% each year, I compute how much my tier one capital will be that year. No, to get that, remember I need my risk adjusted assets. My starting risk ad adjusted assets is about $446 billion. I'm gonna assume a growth rate equal to the inflation rate. Not even real growth, but just the inflation growth. And that risk adjusted assets multiplied by my tier one capital ratio each year gives me my tier one capital each year. So notice that in year one, I need to bring in $6.55 billion in new capital into the company. What does that mean? Well, don't you, we'll have to go out and raise equity to get to that tier one capital. And each year, what you see in tier one in capital change becomes the equivalent of reinvestment for Deutsche. For traditional companies, we think about CapEx and working capital. For banks, this is the analogous item for reinvestment. That change in tier one capital each year, subtracted from my net income, gives me my free cash flow equity. What's my free cash flow equity? That's my potential dividend. And if you look at that number, for the first three years, I get negative values, which means that there's not even a question of whether Deutsche can pay dividends. It's no business paying dividends. And even after year three, in year four, they still have a negative free cash flow equity. It's only in year five that I start to see the glimmers of cash flows. And that will be their potential dividend. I've, in a sense, replaced the actual dividends with what my estimates of what they can afford to pay out is. That is that last column are the cash flows I'm going to be discounting. I'm almost home, right? I've got cash flows. And those cash flows then will become my cash flows. And you can see it play out here. So as my net income, my risk-adjusted assets go up by 1%. My tier 1 capital climbs from 12.41 to 15.67%. As my tier one capital increases, I have a reinvestment I'm making of you know, captured each year. Free cash flow equity in the last column. My last piece for this puzzle is a cost of equity. Now I could go about this a conventional route. Take risk free rate plus beta times risk premium. But then you know it's it requires your belief that this is the right model, your uh, agreement with my beta. So I decided to take a different path. A model agnostic way of estimating cost of equity. And here's what I had to do to get there. I made the assumption that the median bank is a pretty mature company. What does that mean? It's growing at a constant rate forever. If you have a mature company, the price to book ratio for a mature company can be written as the difference between the return equity and the growth rate in the numerator and the cost of equity in the growth rate in the denominator. If you work through the algebra, you can then solve for the cost of equity as the return equity minus the growth rate divided by the price to book plus the growth rate. You think, where's this going? Remember the median bank had a return in equity of 9.91%. The median bank had a price to book ratio of 1.06. And I'm going to assume that the median bank grows at a stable growth rate, which I've said equal to my risk-free rate of 1.6%. I'm doing everything in U.S. dollars. You work with those numbers, the implied cost of equity for a median bank is 9.44%. Now, if I apply the same same approach to the 25th and the 75th percentile, I get a cost of equity of 7.76% for the 25th percentile and 10.2% for the 75th percentile. So a risky bank has a cost of equity of 10.2, a safe bank 7.76, a median bank of 9.44%. To value Deutsche, I started off assuming they were a risky bank. And that's not a bad assumption given all the talk swirling around. I gave them a cost of equity of 10.2%. For the next five years, I leave them as a risky bank. But then as they dig their way out of the problems, they start to make money. They're now a large, profitable bank. I move their cost of equity towards that of a median bank, 9.44%. Now, when your cost of equity changes over time, as I'm assuming it will, you have to compute what's called accumulated cost of equity. Sounds fancy, but to get a, that accumulated cost of equity in year six, here's what I have to do. I have to discount at 10.2% for five years and 10.05% in year six. I can't just discount my year six cash flow at my year six cost of equity. So that accumulated cost of equity is what I use to discount the cash flows. And notice this is really big cash flow in year 10, the terminal value. That is based on the assumption that Deutsche earns its cost of equity in perpetuity after year 10 and grows at the inflation rate. So not horribly daring assumptions, but that's my big number. Discount them all back. I get a value for the equity of $31.84 billion. Deutsche at 1,386 million shares outstanding. You divide by the number of shares, you get a value per share of $22.97. I'm not quite done, though. 
there is always the possibility with a bank of what I call catastrophic failure, where you get into a vicious cycle of bad news giving more bad news leading to more bad news. And there is this possibility with Deutsche. And people are talking about it that the bank might not make it, that there might have to be a bailout, in which case the bank will make it, but your equity will be gone. I'm going to attach a 10% probability to it. And that 10% is just my judgment. You, mean, you might decide it's higher or non-existent. I, and I'm going to assume I get nothing as an equity investor if that happens. My expected value then will be 90% of 2297, which is $20.67. Now you say, what about the dilution effect? Well, it's already in there. You're saying, where? Remember those negative cash flows in years one through four? If you discount those negative cash flows, they account for minus $10.66 per share. I've knocked off my value per share by 32% for expected dilution. That's why it's a mistake to adjust the number of shares as well, because that'll be double counting. I've also knocked it off another 6.8% for the possibility of catastrophic loss, my equity getting wiped out. That's how I get from 33.63 to 20.67 is I've already reflected my fears of delusion and my worries of not making it in my expected value. So here's where we are, at least based on my assumptions, and I made a lot of them. The value per share I get is $20.67. The stock at the time that I did this assessment was $13.33. Two choices. I can act, and I don't see why I would, I would do an evaluation if I don't intend to act and buy the stock. Or I can wait. Wait for what? Wait for the uncertainty to go away. That they you know, argue that there's too much uncertainty. But what next? I mean, there are two things that can happen. Either the uncertainty is going to be resolved, either in good ways or bad ways. And once it's resolved, everybody's going to know what's going to happen. The price and the value will then reflect that clarity and my opportunity will be gone. Or I can wait and the uncertainty will not get resolved and I'll keep waiting. And not, I'll make no money, lose no money, but I'll just be a bystander. To me, this is no contest. I don't think it makes sense to for inaction when you can act. So I, I bought yesterday. And I might live to regret it because I've done this before and some of my bets, like the one I made on JP Morgan after the London Whale or Volkswagen after the emission scandal have paid off. And some of my bets, like the one I made on Valiant a few months ago, hasn't yet. I still, I'm still holding on to value and hoping it will turn around, but it might not. I'm hoping Deutsche does better, but I'm strapped in for a really rough ride. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much for listening.